Welcome back to Conversations. Our guest today is Peter Thiel, one of America's leading investors and entrepreneurs, and also a very, as you'll see, a very interesting thinker about American, the American economy, American business, American society, American politics. Peter, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. Peter, we met, what, a little over 25 years ago, I guess, when you were an undergraduate at Stanford, I think, and you were active in politics and looking forward to going to law school. And here you are. You're not a politician. You're not a lawyer. What what happened? Well, I'm still I'm still very interested in all all these sorts of questions. But uh, yeah, I, I probably started as a very uh, conventionally tracked career. Was Stanford undergrad, Stanford Law School. Uh, worked in a big law firm in New York for a number for a while, and then a big bank in New York, and uh, and sort of had this rolling quarter life crisis where I finally concluded that uh, that I should uh, that uh, it made sense to try to do something where. Uh, with your life where um, if you wouldn't do it, it wouldn't happen versus these tracked careers where, uh, you know, if you don't do it, there are a hundred other people who will take your place and do the exact, the exact same thing. And uh, in, the, in the late 90s, I moved back to California, got involved in the, uh, in the internet boom, started a company called PayPal, uh, four years later was bought by eBay, and then since uh, 2002, I've been uh, uh, sort of an investor helping people get started with uh, a number of different tech companies. But it's been a, it's been a wild uh, wild uh, twenty five years. Well, that's great. That's great. So let's talk a little bit more about how this. So you're there in New York. You're in the legal financial world. And what was dissatisfying about that? And what was the attraction of going to Silicon Valley? And was there any particular thing that spurred the move? Or? Well, it was. It's it's uh, it is. What's what's amazing about uh, these uh, top U S. institutions in the U S. Whether academic or um, you know, law firms, banks, uh, is that from the outside there are places where everybody wants to get in, um, and then once you're once you're in them, uh, it turns out that uh, it's always fairly constricted. You have enormous numbers of very talented people, and so that's that's the th that's the aspect that's very positive. Uh, but then it's also uh, it ends up being uh, involving a ferocious amount of competition for what I think are often relatively uh, small stakes where. Uh, you know, at Sullivan and Cromwell, the New York law firm I was at, you'd have 80 very talented people start every year. Uh, four or five might make partner after seven or eight years, um, and uh, and it was very unclear, even for the people who became partner, how much impact they would have on the on the broader world. So it uh, you had sort of these people who are incredibly ambitious going in, and it sort of gradually uh, gets wrung out of them over time. And entrepreneurship struck you as different. I I think uh, I do think that. Uh, Silicon Valley, uh, the technology industry, is still an exception to this. Where uh, you know we are, we're living in a society where the frontier is not as wide open as it was in the 19th century. Uh, geographically, it's maybe you can still go to Alaska, but there aren't that many places one can move to where there's sort of a wide open space left. Uh, technology, I think, is is one place where where that still exists and where it is possible for uh, a small group of people. To start something new uh, that has a, a big impact on, on the world as a whole. And so, how did that happen with PayPal? Did you sort of decide I want to go to Silicon Valley, and you'd been, of course, in Stanford, and reconnect with friends there, and then figure out yeah, what you wanted to do, or did you actually I mean, so, have the idea for PayPal first, and then? Cer so. Certainly, the fact that I was at Stanford was quite helpful, since uh, it is probably the university that's most embedded in this, and, and there were a lot of friends I had who were getting involved in the in the uh, internet boom of the of the '90s. Um, we had, um, you know, these things are always, uh, it's always somewhat of a process. There's some serendipity. There's some, um, some planning. We had, uh, we had this idea, of, I think, from very early on to create a new payments company. Uh, it was, uh, um, and there were sort of all sorts of questions, what one have, would have to do to make that work. A number of these efforts had already failed by 98. And so we learned from some of the mistakes. And the we in this is what? Uh, just myself, a group of uh, Max Lefton was my co-founder, and there were sort of, Th uh, three or four other other people involved early on in the team, and and it was it was a crazy process coming up with the right idea, hit on the idea of linking money with the email, which was a simple idea, it turned out to be very hard to implement because of all the fraud challenges one had, and then uh, and then you uh, then it gradually sort of uh, scaled very quickly. We started with uh, 24 people using PayPal in October of uh, uh, 1999, which was the 24 people working at our company. And it grew by about seven to ten percent, compounding daily. So we were at a thousand people by mid-November, uh, twelve thousand by December thirty-first, a hundred thousand by February third, uh, uh, two thousand, a million by mid-April, 
and uh, and then you know it's kept scaling. Today, the PayPal service has probably on the order of 120 million people people using it. So, you know, uh, I think Einstein uh, apocryphally said that uh, compound interest was the most powerful force in the universe. And and if you can get something that has this snowballing effect going, it's uh, it's very powerful. Whether it's in technology or culture, politics, all sorts of aspects. You want to get positive feedback, things like that, not things where as you make progress, every incremental step gets much harder. You, you don't want to have sort of trench warfare on the Western Front in World War I where you can make a push for maybe 100 feet. You want to do something where as you make progress, it, uh, it cascades. And what was so the core insight was people are going to want to pay for things online, obviously. Um, but that was already happening or not really? I the, guess they were people the core, were. Uh, the core insight was that um, most people are not set up to accept uh, credit card payments. Uh, in the U.S., there are about uh, three million people who have uh, are, are set up to accept credit cards. There were about 150 or 200 million people with email addresses. So, if you could link money to email, then anyone with an email could uh, could receive the payment. And it was a way to start a payment system uh, from scratch. Normally, there's an enormous counterparty challenge where you need to get both sides involved simultaneously. So, uh, so by linking money to email, you could send. Um, money to someone with an email address who has not yet signed up with PayPal, and then they'd click on various links, and then they'd be incented to sign up so they could collect their money. And so, uh, so you wanted to have sort of a one-way payment system where um, it could go to people who are not yet officially part of it. Uh, and these were people selling things on eBay mostly, or it, um, at first, it, or it uh, it took off on eBay, and then we sort of directed a lot of the focus um, on the product towards eBay very, uh, very, very quickly. There were you know, there were a lot of competitive challenges one ran into. eBay had its own competing service, which is sort of an uncomfortable thing. So it was like this giant store that couldn't get its own cash register machines to work. And we had a competing service, ours, that was um, offering the cash register machines that worked better. Uh, there were, you know, there were fraud challenges, there were regulatory challenges. But, uh, but there was, there was um, the underlying need for the product was very great, and that enabled us to sort of uh, power through a lot of that stuff. And Defeating other competitors. I mean, how does that work in this case? Surely, other people thought, "Gee, yeah, I can do that too." Or is it do you, you just have to get the snowball going fast enough that you become dominant in the field? I don't, I don't say just, but that, is that the well, key? Well, it's. Or? it's uh, I, I do think in business, uh, one of the critical things is uh, that you don't want excess competition. So, if you have lots of people doing the same thing, it's very hard uh, for you to have a good business. So, if you're the twentieth person selling uh, pet food on the internet. Um, it's unlikely you will have a fantastic business or opening a restaurant in DC or San Francisco is a, is a terrible business. Um, and so good businesses, I think, always have this extremely unique character. Uh, you can certainly get it by being sort of a first mover where you grow incredibly fast. And so if you are the first one and you grow quickly enough that no one can catch up, that, uh, that can work. And that was, I think that was our original plan was just to have this exponential growth and so even if people copied us six months or a year later, uh, they would never catch up. Um, in practice, I think it's more important to be the last mover than the first mover. Sort of a Capablanca line in chess that, uh, you know, t um, to begin you must study the end game because that's, you know, you, you win if you're the last mover, not if you're the first mover is a tactic, last mover is, is what really matters. Um, and I think the key, uh, a key component there is often to have some kind of technological edge uh, it was not obvious what that was initially with PayPal. It turned out there was an enormous amount of fraud on the internet, and there were some technological solutions we came up with. And um, the existence of this fraud deterred a lot of the large competitors from entering the space, uh, large banks, large institutions, where uh, the consultants would tell them, there's too much fraud, you can't do this. And they ended up launching products that just didn't work. Yeah, but stepping, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but just stepping back and thinking about it, you'd think that the credit card companies and or the banks, I guess some of whom own the credit cards, um, would have thought, yeah, we can do this. You know, we, we're pretty used to processing payments. So why should we let some upstart company seize a huge market here? Uh, the, you know, it's, it's large, um, large corporations are probably better than the government, but in many cases uh, are, are quite uh, dysfunctional. And so, yes, in theory, if the large a corporation were a monolithic institution with a singleness of purpose. Uh, that's how you'd respond, and and the CEO of Visa might say, you know, why is this happening? Right. But then, uh, in practice, you have um, you have incredibly uh, incredibly many 
bureaucratic levels on the inside. There was a Citigroup was a um, try to launch a competing service, but the people inside it sort of sensed this was unlikely to work, and so you end up with less talented people working on it. The smarter people in these organizations always know not to work on things that are unlikely to succeed, and so you have all these complex internal politics that uh, that um, make it surprisingly possible for um, small companies to emerge and uh, not to be just squashed by larger larger organizations. And did you all envision it? Uh, you sort of envisioned obviously exponential growth and you understood that would be key to your success, but uh, you pretty much envisioned it filling the niche it filled or was it something you adjusted in a big way as you went forward? People, you sometimes read about these business books and people say, oh, it was totally unanticipated, it worked out totally differently, I was very agile and had to adapt to circumstances. Yes, I, I always, um, you know, I, there was definitely a lot of adaptation. At the same time, I think there was this this founding vision of creating a new payment system on the internet, and that 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 sort of uh, drove it all the way through. And so I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit more partial to the side of uh, having a long-term plan and using that as something you uh, you build around versus the sort of random walk theory that uh, that dominates, where you you iterate very quickly and you have no uh, overarching vision. Uh, you know, when I was a when I was a chess player, uh, intermediate level chess lesson was always that uh, a bad plan was better than no plan. And, uh, and I think something like this is uh, true in business. We always say that you can't have a plan. You can't have a plan, especially in technology, because things will be so different in five or ten years. Who's to know what it's going to be like? But I think it's always uh, worth asking those questions. Most of the value of these businesses um, accrues over the very long term. Uh, there was a financial model we did on PayPal in March of 2001, we'd been in business for 27 months, and we concluded that about 80% of the value of the company came from profits in years 2011 and beyond. And that's, that's sort of, um, that's analytically true of almost all these businesses. The value exists far in the future. And so one of the critical questions is really, will you still be around 10, 15 years from now? Because that's where, where most of the value uh, um, exists and so it is even though the, the long-term questions have a qualitative nature um, durability is at least as important as growth. Yeah, when I've heard you talk about business in the past you, you use the term founders and co-founders maybe a little more than most people do and maybe the term entrepreneur a little less. I guess entrepreneur has a certain needn't be this way I suppose but has a certain feel of making it up as you go along, right? You know, yes. the well, founder has a little more of a feel of, you know, yes. setting up an institution that's there to last. Yeah, so definitely like founder more than entrepreneur. I think I think entrepreneur has, um, it's a bit of a overused term, so it's a, I had a conversation with a friend a number of years ago where I asked him, what do you really want to be doing in five or ten years? And it's very clear, I want to be an entrepreneur. And so it has sort of the same quality right. as, I want to be rich, I want to be famous. And I think, um, I think a better mindset for for these businesses is that there are some very important problems that you're trying to solve and it turns out that uh, um, a new business is a, is a form in which you solve that problem. You could also solve it perhaps in a large corporation if it's not too dysfunctional. You could solve it in a government context, in a nonprofit context, but, uh, but that it's driven by important problems you're trying to solve rather than say having a line item on your resume that says entrepreneur. And once you found it, then I guess the as you say, the c continuity is so important, or the, or the durability, I guess. And that, you hadn't, I mean, that's amazing that you did this. You, did you all have much experience with managing people, things? I mean, you, you had been a lawyer and you'd been a... Uh, in, in, practice, in practice, most of the founders in Silicon Valley have shockingly little right. previous experience. Uh, the, the dynamics that tend to be very important is whether the, the initial teams uh, work together really well. So there's often some sort of prehistory where the people had known each other or worked together for a while. That was that was certainly the case at, at PayPal. There's, uh, but th there is um, there is sort of this very strange element where um, talent often seems to beat experience. Uh, that uh, when people are experienced, there's certain things they know better, but they've also learned uh, many uh, many mistaken lessons. They've developed a lot of anti theories e.g. theories on why things can't be done, why certain ways can't be done. Um, you know, when we started PayPal, we were told that the fraud problem was going to be overwhelming. And uh, we sort of ignored that advice. It turned out to be very big, but then you could sort of get on top of it. Whereas the someone who had come from a conventional payments background would have said something like this was never going to work. 
and you would not even try. So I do think I do think there's an element, um, an element of that that's uh, that's very big. Um, I do think the, uh, you know, I think the founding moments of these uh, of these businesses are, are quite important because there's a degree of freedom you have at a founding moment that you no, do not have later. So you can say that the the founders of the United States, the um, right. Constitutional Convention, um, had a degree of freedom in deciding what to do that uh, is not clear whether we have later. So you know, it's you know, you now have you know, Alaska has the same number of senators as, Cal as California. You know, California has 50 times as many people, and we can sort of debate whether that's a feature or a bug, but it's not going to change. Right. And uh, and I think something very sim the sort of the, a lot of the key DNA in these companies gets set. Uh, Get set very early, and so there is an extraordinary degree of uh, freedom around these founding moments, and then, um, and then it's sort of, and then years later, um, if you set it up well, it can, it can last for a long time. If not, it, it probably won't. I mean, I've been struck in the things I've been involved in, which are government and then really magazine, the Weekly Standard. Um, hiring the right people is the single most important thing. I think one of the very most important things one does. It's not something that people focus on much, though, and often it's almost uh, considered the tenth most, you know, you, you focus much more on all kinds of other things, and then incidentally you have an interview, job interview, which you put off till 5.30 in the afternoon because it's, you know, you're so busy all day. Yes. Um, I mean, it's, uh, Yeah, well, people pay lip service to talent being important, but certainly, certainly it's, it is probably the all-important thing in these, uh, in these early organizations. And what I think is quite different from, a, say, an academic context where, it's always individual talent, and uh, um, it actually, in in a corporation or when you're founding a, a new institution, um, it's often very critical that people be able to work together uh, reasonably well. And so it's it's not good enough to have a group of uh, brilliant professional people who all intensely dislike each other. Um, that can that maybe that can work in a law firm, but uh, it probably does not work in something where uh, you need sort of a very Intense cooperation to do something. I think the only, you know, the only rough anal analog is something like team sports. But that's, that's, right. that's sort of, you know, the rules are very set, and that's sort of a much more controlled context. And so, so getting a group of very talented people to work together is uh, is quite important. I I think the prehistory ends up being uh, a very important question that I like to I like to focus on is how long had the people known each other? How often how have they worked together in the past? Uh, you know, if you um, if you decide to start a company with someone you met uh, a week earlier, it would be like getting married to the first person you met at the slot machines in Las Vegas. You know, you might you might hit the jackpot, but it's probably a bad idea. And I think in hiring people, you had sort of uh, your own distinctive questions you like to ask. I, I remember hearing that once. Well, we we um, you know, there's sort of our different ways of iterating on this over time, but but we we certainly we certainly focused on um, on all these. Uh, um, on a group of original um, talented thinkers. The, the question I've, I don't think I was asking this one at the time of PayPal, but the one I've come to, to like um, asking is, uh, tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on. And it's a, uh, it's a surprisingly difficult question because uh, it requires, you know, we've been taught that all truth is conventional, that it's simply what everyone uh, knows to be true uh, universally. And so it's sort of, uh, very much cuts against the grain of the way people think about things, but uh, but it's also the case that uh, uh, you know brilliance is hard, uh, courage is even an even shorter supply than uh, than brilliance. In some sense, the correct answer to that question is one that the interviewer um, would presumably disagree with. Right. And so um, it always. What answers do you usually get? That seems like an interesting uh, question to you, ask young you, people. You end up with uh, you. You generally. I'm not even sure it's that good a question because people mm. are so bad at answering it. You right. only want questions where people are are better, better or worse. Um, you you often um, you occasionally get good answers, but most most of the time it's uh, it's some conventional truth that people say is even more true than anybody thinks. So it's like. I'm worried about climate change, and I'm even more worried than everybody else. People right. are not worried enough. Or, or you get answers, um, you know, you sort of get uh, very trivial, esoteric answers, where it's something um, that uh, is, is certainly an unusual truth, but perhaps not a very important uh, uh, truth about things. Um, I, I do think the, the strongest ones are ones that somehow um, cut against this, this grain. And I, I, I think. I think one of the things that uh, 
that I've come to sort of really appreciate over the years is how powerful uh, these uh, psychosocial forces in our society are that basically um, uh, push people's thinking into a you know homogenizing uh, kind of direction and you know it's, it's in, you know on the level of the uh, of the larger economy in the US we've had this extraordinary history of bubbles in the last uh, few decades which uh, which clearly had a psychosocial component where people were not thinking very much for themselves you, know, you had a house um, internet bubble in the 90s um, an even crazier and more destructive housing and finance bubble in the 2000s and I would argue a even dumber and bigger and worse government bubble in the uh, in the 2010s but uh, but uh, all these things were sort of characterized by um, extreme lack of critical thinking uh, assuming that other people had figured things out and uh, and uh, deferring to that in in one way or another and so whenever whenever you see uh, a situation where it's very hard for people to think uh, critically on their own. Um, you have to sort of wonder whether whether there's something uh, very off on this. There was, uh, you know, uh, and uh, and I think you can often get at these unconventional truths um, through a means that you know maybe you could I'm not sure what the right terminology is, but you can sort of describe it as a political approach where you sort of ask the question, what are the things people can't say or can't think, and maybe there's sort of a natural or metaphysical approach where you just try to figure out the fundamental truth of things. And I always have a preference for the political approach because I think it's uh, so much uh, more straightforward and it's a kind of a shortcut. So uh, by way of example, in the, uh, in the last decade in Silicon Valley, 2002 to 2008, um, there were basically two major things one did as a venture capitalist. You invested in the next generation of internet companies or you invested in clean tech. And the next generation of internet companies generally worked pretty well. Clean tech was sort of an unmitigated a disaster. And the critical question was how could you have figured this out early? Um, mm -hmm. And the sort of the, the, the scientific, natural, metaphysical type of approach would have been to evaluate every single clean technology on its merits. And then you have to figure out were people lying about it? Were they distorting the results? How far were things off? And one could have done that, but it would have been would have been extremely hard to, to figure this out. The uh, political approach was to realize that there were sort of a set of intensely held conventions that people could not question. Um, uh, there was, um, and there was something, you know, there were sort of things around it involving social status. It, it seemed cool for people to be involved in this. Uh, they were not that interested in whether it made any sense. And, uh, and that's sort of that's sort of why clean tech was not just an initial set of bad investments, but why maybe 10 times as much uh, good money was thrown after bad in the 2005 to 2008 period. You have the sense that this psychosocial conformism or herd mentality or whatever you want to call it is stronger now than it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, or is it just the way democracy is, kind of a Tocquevillian, you know? I don't have a, it's always hard to, to compare. I. I do worry that there are elements of it that are that are somewhat uh, stronger. We're we're living in, in a sort of more globally connected, more transparent world. Um, it often seems more dangerous for people to um, express unconventional ideas because there's a record of that, and so you, people sort of uh, maybe are censoring themselves more than they were uh, more than they were 50 years ago. Um, there's um, and so it is. There are sort of a lot of things where I, I'd find that somewhat worrisome. You know, there's the, I'm not going to get this quote exactly right, but there's the Nietzsche line that, you know, madness is rare in individuals, but in nations and crowds of people, you know, it's sort of the rule. Of course, right. before Nietzsche himself went mad, but. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but I think, I think there is, so I do, I do think there's something, um, there is something very peculiar about the, the history of the bubbles that we've been experiencing in the last, uh, in the last few decades, which is, which is quite anomalous. Um, you know, there was there was an enormous bubble in the 1720s. There was one in the 1920s, but we've had maybe maybe four or five of roughly the same magnitude in the last uh, in the last 30 years. And so I do think if you were if you were looking at an EKG chart of right. the health of the world and you started seeing all these up and down spikes, uh, it might be a mistake to say that everything's normal and very sane and under control. Yeah, it does seem. I struck by this. I always try myself to begin with a contrarian 
point of view or challenge to whatever everyone's agreeing on. You know, I just think in po politics, at least in my experience, works out fairly often to be the opposite of what everyone thinks. Not always, and um, maybe one problem here, and this is, is that, of course, it does often, sometimes conventional wisdom is just right, and these yes. forces chuck along, and then, of course, being contrary and uh, does you no good. And maybe if you're one of the few contrarians, you actually get held out for, you know, um, it's, it's just so much easier, I think you're right, to be part of the crowd. It is, although, although I, think, um, I think the relative impact is, is unusual to be, unlikely to be that big. So it's, if, right. if, if you're one of sort of a very large crowd that's trying to do something, you know, it's sort of always this question, what's, what's even the point? Because right. it will happen anyway, it won't, you won't make that much of a difference relative to what you could, you could otherwise do. And so I, I do think it's always, you know, the question has two parts. It's uh, tell me something people, other people don't believe in, and that is true. So we right. do want, well, we do important. want the intersection. Now that is important, yeah. And you're saying that actually is, you think, a good predictor for individuals' ability to contribute to the success of the enterprise. Not, it's not just an interesting intellectual quirk that some people have that they can sort of uh, see around corners or are willing to kind of uh, take an opposite point of view. Well, I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's sufficient. Right. You certainly want to have certain, all sorts of other personality traits that, right. that work, out, work out positively. But I, I do think um, the power of conventional thinking is um, is incredibly great. You know, sort sort of one way of one other way of getting at this question is: Are these psychosocial forces greater now than they were were in the past? Uh, one 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 very odd uh, aspect of Silicon Valley is how many of the uh, founders of these companies seem to be suffering from mild forms of Asperger's or uh, seem to be sort of socially somewhat awkward. And uh, and I always think uh, that we should interpret this as an indictment of of American society where what does it say about our society where anybody who is um, sort of a well-adjusted normal person is deterred from having any unconventional thoughts uh, very very quickly and so uh, so sort of the, the the sort of the personality type that seems to be extremely bad at, at founding these companies is, um, is someone who gets an MBA from say Harvard or a place like that and if you if you think of uh, a lot of the MBA programs as these hothouse environments in which you have extremely extroverted people who have no strong convictions of their own get together for two years, at the end of which they, they basically um, right. are all looking to each other for what to do and they all end up trying to sort of ride the last wave. There, there was a study done on uh, Harvard Business School where they found that the um, largest number of people systematically went to the wrong thing. So <laughs> in, in 89, they all wanted to work for Mike Milken just a year or two before he went to jail. Um, they were never interested in technology except 99, 2000, which was probably the two worst years to go into it. Uh, you know, 05 to 07, it was all private equity, hedge funds, real estate. And so, and so I do think that's, that, is a, that is a very powerful factor in our society. Yeah, that's interesting. I want to come back to some of these broader considerations, but I was just think on this question of fraud, which I think is so interesting, where you say that the conventional view at Visa or some other place like that was, you know, the fraud problem is too great in dealing with all these individuals. I guess that was the point. You could deal with a restaurant or with a right. with Bloomingdale's was there. Right. You know, they have their own systems in place, right. but just some guy selling something to someone else on eBay is so hard to monitor. And and I, if I'm not mistaken, your solution to the fraud problem both enabled eBay to be the great success it was, but also laid the groundwork for further companies that you yes. were involved in founding. So I, I just think that's an interesting example maybe to, to t how yes. did you solve the problem actually? Yes. I mean, uh, in what ways did it, did it almost trip you up or was it just, did it turn out to be not as big as people thought? Well, actually, and then what, what was the after effect so I think this is a good example of a somewhat unconventional solution that we came up with where the uh, conventional approaches to fraud were either, number one, that you had a human team that investigated um, everything. So and fraud here is just Normal credit card fraud. It's people it's stealing people money from other people, things. pretending to be other people, right, the usual. all sorts of complicated patterns it takes. And so you could have a team of human investigators that could look into it. And uh, this was like looking for a needle in a haystack. You had millions of transactions, and it was just completely overwhelming for the team of 20 investigators we had uh, looking at that. Um, the other sort of conventional model was that you had a super duper computer that figured everything out on its own. And this probably would require a generalized artificial intelligence which does not exist now and we can debate whether it will exist in a hundred years or, or never. Um, and that was sort of the, the pure computer uh, solution. And that also uh, was, was not going to work. 
what, uh, what turned out to be extremely powerful as a, as a paradigm was a hybrid solution in which you had, um, you figured out the proper division of labor between um, the humans and the computers and uh, had the computer basically um, flag somewhat suspicious things. You trained people to visualize transactions and, uh, and that turned out to be a, an extremely, uh, extremely powerful technique. Um, and one of the, yeah, one of the companies uh, that I helped start in 2004 is a company called uh, Palantir Technologies, which uh, try to use the same sort of paradigm in the, um, in the uh, counterterrorism um, national security space, where, um, again, we have sort of a pure human solution where you just have human analysts and no one knows what anyone else is doing. This is perhaps characteristic of the CIA. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a, a pure computer solution where you collect all the data in the world, but you have no idea what you, what all you have, which is maybe characteristic of, say, the NSA within our system, and uh, and it turns out again that some some hybrid approach is vastly more powerful. I think the hybrid approach is is very underexplored in general because uh, we we think of computers as substitutes for human beings. Um, um, in the in reality, I think they are they're they're fundamentally complementary. Um, computers are good at very different things from what, what people are good. And uh, the dominant narratives in our society on the computer age are either Luddite or ut sort of utopian in a negative way where the, um, we have to stop the computers from replacing us or the computers will replace us and that's okay. a good thing. Um, whereas I think this sort of complementarity is, um, is probably the, the much greater reality. There are, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's conceivable that you could build a computer that would be smarter than a human being in every respect. I think that's still somewhere between science fiction and science fiction fantasy. Yeah, and Palantir, I know people in the military, who've been in the military, and work with the military, who say it's really ama amazingly helpful in the fight against terrorism or in fights in general, and other more, other things, other national security well, things Well, there certainly have to are large classes of, there, there are large classes of things one can, one can surface. So it, uh, I, you know, it, it, I think it did help uh, connect some of the dots in the uh, bin Laden, um, uh, in identifying bin Laden. Uh, certainly a lot of the insider trading cases the SEC has brought have involved uh, combining the dots in, in, in certain types of ways. So I think, I think we, have, we have all these intuitions around what, what one could know. And I think one has to be sort of a lot, if you were inclined to engage in insider trading, I would, uh, I would strongly discourage you from doing so. That's, a, that's good advice and edifying advice, but, and maybe true advice in this case. But say more, word more, just more about Palantir, which I think people would be interested in. How does it work? I mean, I, it sort of maps these, these networks. Is that basically right, or it visualizes them somehow? Yes, so there's, there's always a front-end uh, user piece where you, you're able to visualize certain networks. The, the, it turns out there's also a lot of back-end technology of combining all these different databases. So one of the big back-end challenges is that you have um, all these databases that basically do not connect in any way. Uh, so the NSA is overhearing phone calls from, or knowing that phone calls have been made between person A and person B, and then you have visual identification. And then you the have person A is also met with person C, and there are credit card payments from person B to person yes. F. And somehow what Palantir does is put that all together so and say, well, here's the terror network you should be worried about in yes. Afghanistan. Yes, so the back end technology would be to combine all these elements, and then the front end technology. Is uh, is effectively this this visualization engine where if you're trained as an analyst you can you can learn to recognize certain suspicious patterns and there's there's sort of ways that you work with the computer and, and really uh, really understanding this stuff quite effectively but yeah I think it's it's uh, I think we're so fixated on this computers replacing people that we have not asked the question enough of how can uh, people work better with computers and it's just amazing to me that the counterterrorism effort, not amazing, but surprising, I guess, that the counterterrorism effort came out of this anti, you know, credit card fraud uh, yeah, effort. Well, well, cer certainly when we started Palantir in 2004, the, you know, the thinking, you know, we would not have thought that, uh, that seven years later the technology would, you know, they still wouldn't have caught bin Laden, and that our technology would be, would be, uh, would be uh, used in that context. So it's, uh, it is, um, you know, I, th I think that there are, um, I, th I think that there are a lot of uh, people in these agencies who mean quite well. Uh, I do think, um, I do think it's, um, it is surprising how, how hard it's been to get uh, technological innovation uh, inside these these agencies to work. Even though 
would seem like there's enormous need to do so post uh, post 9-11. And is that a government problem of just uh, governments are so bad at understanding and ad adopting technology or is it more of a the people who work there problem of not? Uh, I, you know, it's why questions are always really hard to answer, yeah, yeah. but I, I, I suspect that uh, the bureaucratic incentives uh, really cut against uh, people making a sustained effort for several years to build right. something that, uh, that really works. There's an aspect, uh, that I, th I think there is something quite toxic about the whole contractor subculture in D.C. where uh, people have incentives to sort of build by the hour, to have projects that take, uh, take really long. Um, and uh, and are sort of overly complex so that nobody really has has responsibility. I mean, I you know I'm sort of more on the libertarian side politically and generally skeptical of government ability to do things. But even I was shocked that something like the Obamacare website couldn't work. And so that's you know this is not the Manhattan Project. And right. so there has been I think there has been some decline in the government's ability to do these things. And I suspect I suspect um, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, very um, with bureaucratic incentives that are um, extremely, uh, extremely misaligned. We knew each other back when you were running PayPal, and so I probably don't think of you quite in the context that most Americans probably uh, do, which is Facebook. That's, uh, you've done so much with PayPal, Palantir, LinkedIn, so many other companies, and also philanthropic activities. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Facebook. How did it happen? How did it get going? What, what, has it, what were the biggest surprises in the early years? Well, it, um, it, you know, people always ask, was it extremely hard to figure out how to invest in Facebook when I did in 2000, 2004? At the time, it, was a, it felt like actually a relatively straightforward investment. They were already on 20 college campuses. So 2004, so Zuckerberg has done, he's, it's, it's he recently just Harvard. Harvard. in February of 04. He's in uh, California, summer of 04, looking for investors. Um, and uh, my friend Reid Hoffman, who started LinkedIn, and I ran across uh, Zuckerberg and uh, basically decided to, to uh, give him another half million or so dollars to, to scale it. Uh, it was generally a good sign when the only thing you needed money for was to buy more computers because there was so, such demand for the product. Uh, it was people were probably too negative on these social networking companies at the time because there had been a few that had sort of come and gone. So there was a sense that it was this faddish thing that would, would maybe get users for a year and then collapse. Uh, but uh, but if you actually looked at the intensity of usage that people had on Facebook, uh, how much time people were spending on it, how much they were using it, um, and the, the sort of network effects it had, uh, it seemed to be very powerful. I, I did not I did not think it would sort of certainly I didn't think it was going to become quite as big as it has today. Uh, but we thought that uh, at the time I thought it could be sort of a new media company that would effectively. Uh, um, uh, be an equivalent of an online media for all the college newspapers in the U.S. and you basically have a media channel to reach all the all the colleges in this country, and that seemed that seemed like quite a right. quite a valuable. Because originally, if I'm not mistaken, I seem to remember this from decades ago when I was at Harvard. There was the Facebook was right. either the real name or the kind of colloquial name, right, for the yes. pictures of all of yes. us in the freshman book, yeah, so, physical book, yeah, and actually, so you would know if you met someone, you, know, you could look them up. Yeah, actually Facebook, the initial name for Facebook was thefacebook.com. So they even, they even copied that and right. it, was, it was basically... And so it was just putting on, not just, but it was putting online in a certain way something that existed in hard copy in that respect. And then it had a more dynamic aspect where people could update it, people uh, could learn more about diff different each people other. on it, they could talk to each other on it. Uh, it um, but I think, I, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think on the whole Facebook uh, is is a very you know I'm obviously a little bit biased here, but I, I think it uh, is a very uh, very good service and uh, and one of the ways in which um, it worked w worked quite differently from some of the earlier social networking efforts. So in the 1990s, people thought there would be this virtual reality on the internet right. where you had uh, you had some sort of alter ego in some chat room on AOL or something like that, and maybe you know you'd pretend to be a cat and I'd pretend to be a dog, and we'd right. have to figure out how we would relate and. Uh, <laughs> And it turned out that people were not really interested in fictional identities. They were interested in, in real identities. And what I, what I think was very powerful about uh, Facebook was that um, it was, um, it was not, it's not this sort of radically alternate reality. It is actually about who people really were. And I think this was why it was so critical to start at a place like, uh, um, like Harvard, where 
uh, um, where people were comfortable uh, representing themselves in a fairly accurate way. Uh, Facebook's main competitor in the early years was a service that was started in Los Angeles called MySpace. And I often think there's something even about the names of these companies that's, uh, that's suggestive of the general direction. So MySpace had sort of this um, Los Angeles narcissistic aspect of, um, uh, of telling people about yourself and sort of people pretending to be somewhat different from who they were, sort of everyone in LA is sort of an actor, that kind of a, right. that kind of a feel. Uh, Facebook was fundamentally about learning about other people. Um, and you could say that all these social networks require people to both uh, write and to read. Um, unlike uh, the real world, writing comes before reading. So you have to first write something about yourself, then you get to read about other people. But over time, reading dominates writing. And so Facebook was fundamentally about reading. MySpace was more about writing. And so I think even implicit in, in the names was, was this arc of the, of the product. But I think it is, I, th I think this idea that, uh, that um, real identities are more important than fictional identities is, is a positive attribute. And it's, uh, I think it's quite good that the one that was closest to that has, uh, has emerged as the, as the leading service. And was there a moment where you realized, or where Zuckerberg realized, that we, you were going beyond, way beyond, you know, a, a replacement for all of the college hard copy sort of, you know, uh, student guide, you know, student guides, but really what's what was your books or whatever they were, Facebooks, um, to sort of a huge national, well, it's, international. It's, it's just late 2006, early 2007 that it started um, being opened up to non-college students. So I guess it wasn't even open, right, at first? Yes, the first two years was just college students. And was um, that, that in retrospect, was that an important part of the success, that it didn't try to be for everyone right at the beginning somehow? It sort of seems to be unusual. Well, maybe it isn't unusual. Um, it's kind possibly. It's always, you can never run these experiments well, twice. Right, so it's always, it's right. always hard to say. But I think, I think there was, uh, I, I think it turned out to just kept scaling and scaling. This is certainly one of the things that's always very difficult to calibrate in these, uh, in these businesses how far does the growth go? How, how long does it? Uh, how long does it keep going? Um, but I think there there is something about uh, um, you know there was sort of a initially it was just English, then we sort of had multiple languages, uh, multiple age groups, and uh, you know it has gradually uh, uh, brought more and more people on board. And they've I mean there are sort of there were sort of a lot of fairly creative product iterations that were developed. There's sort of this um, this news feed product where people basically have news that's sourced by their friends, and this actually turns out to be, you get, you get sort of a surprisingly large number of quite interesting stories that you find yourself interested in reading. So it's, it's actually quite a powerful news venue at this point. And some people say, well, this is all very nice, but ultimately, isn't it something crazy about a society that's valuing this corporation at so much more than all these businesses that make real things, that, you know, medicines or food or whatever that, that you know, people need to live? And uh, what's, is, there, is that just silly or is there um Well, it's, it's people, um, I, think, I think with all these, you know, Facebook is the iconic Silicon Valley company of the, of the last decade. And it's probably, it's probably worth about as much as all the other uh, businesses started in Silicon Valley combined since 2000. So, so there's sort of a way in which it gets a uh, it gets a disproportionate focus as a as a result. Um, I, I do think there is sort of this modality where we find we either talk about uh, specific success and general success or specific failure and general failure. And so we would like to say, you know, if Facebook is a specific success it must mean some right. general success. Right. And so uh, Facebook is a great business and therefore it will solve all the world's problems. Right. Um, and I think the, the, the modality I prefer uh, to think of is that there are specific successes but they may be symptomatic of general failure. And so Facebook will not solve all the world's problems but it may still be a great business. And, uh, and it's, that's, not a, that's not a critique of Facebook. We shouldn't turn Facebook into a scapegoat for the lack of innovation elsewhere, uh, but the challenge is that it is so um, it's so anomalously unique, and that there are so few other companies like this being built in general. And that's sort of the so I, I tend to think that, uh, that the story of specific success that masks generalized failure is one that we find uh, we find very hard to tell. I, I, for example, have been a, we on our website we have this this uh, tagline. They promised us flying cars, and all we got was 140 characters, which is this is on the website of, of, the, of our venture fund, Founders right, Fund, right? And it's a little bit of a 
They, they, a little again, bit of a, they promised us flying cars. And all we got was 140 characters. So it's a little bit of a dig at, at Twitter. Right. But it's, 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 uh, it's again, in, in some sense, Twitter is, a, is probably a great business. The, you know, the thousand people who work at Twitter are going to have well-paying jobs. I suspect it will last for decades. <coughs> uh, Excuse me. But, but, I, but it's, again, there's a sense that it's probably not enough to take our civilization to the next level. Right. And, but it's, again, it's, it's a mistake to blame Twitter for that. It's, right. it's more a problem with, with not enough happening elsewhere. I do think that if you, if you were to sort of uh, broaden the perspective on the, the last 40 or 50 years, uh, we are living in a world where there has been significant um, innovation in information technology, computers, both hardware, software, internet, mobile internet, um, and much less in everything right. else. And, uh, and there's sort of, are again, many different reasons one can cite for this. Uh, I, I tend to think uh, that we live in a world where bits are quite unregulated, atoms are very heavily regulated. And so, uh, and so it's, uh, it, it would. So explain that for a minute. That's, that's a good, it's a good phrase, but so, in um, other words, information technology, people just do what they if want. You're, if you're Bill Gates uh, starting Microsoft in 1975, you don't have people from the government checking your code, um, checking how safe it is, how dangerous it is. If you're working on a, um, in a biotech company, um, you have sort of massive regulatory uh, barriers all the way through. Or if you're or trying to build a new kind of. You're trying to build a rocket. Right. And so, you know, or the rocket. building, or, yeah. And so, um, even though there's always this sense that um, STEM needs, we need more STEM, sort of science, technology, engineering, uh, math, I, I suspect even STEM is a bit of an abstraction. Uh, right. And, you know, probably the only engineering fields that are doing really well are computer science and maybe at this point petroleum engineering. Right. Um, and most other areas of engineering have been bad career decisions the last uh, 40 years. When I was an undergraduate at Stanford in the 80s, probably the top engineering profession was electrical engineering. And that was, you know, it was, it was not a great field to go into. You'd work in these very large companies and the semiconductor revolution kept going for a while, but it's, it was probably not, a, not that good a career decision. And electrical engineering was still much better than say, nuclear engineering, aerospace engineering, or things like this, which were, uh, which were really catastrophic uh, uh, decisions for, for very talented people to go into. So even though rhetorically we always say that we want more science and engineering people, in practice these have been, uh, these have been extremely tough fields. I mean, you've made this version of this point, I think, but uh, it always strikes me that we say we live at a time of unprecedented change, progress, dynamism. But it's true in some areas, and I think especially, though, in some version of information technology, the intersection of the personal computer mm -hmm. and the Internet. That, I do think, is we are doing things that 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. or 100 years ago, certainly, were just almost inconceivable. But in other areas, aren't you struck by how little change there is? We go to schools that and sit in classrooms that are pretty much like what our yes. parents and what our grandparents did. We live in houses that aren't that unlike our yes. parents. We drive, commute into work, you know, in cars that look Maybe and on a little highways, bit better, but yeah, not, not much. It's such a disproportionate lack of change there compared to the. Yeah, uh, well, if, if you were to be, if you were to be even more critical, you could say that uh, that all of these gadgets and dis devices, uh, they dazzle us, but they also distract us from uh, the ways in which our larger surroundings are strangely old. So we, you know, we're on cell phones while we're riding a 19th century subway system in New York, or right. uh, if you're like San Francisco. Uh, the housing stock looks like it's from the 50s and 60s. It's mostly quite decrepit and uh, incredibly hard to change uh, sort of things. So you have uh, bits making progress. Um, atoms are, 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 are strangely very stuck. I, Is I that because we've made the progress that can be made with atoms and it just sort of, that part of the Industrial Revolution ran out and now we're in a, some kind of... Uh, you well, know, this is uh, always information uh, revolution that's different. This is, I mean. Yeah, this is always the this is always sort of a very uh, fundamental question whether uh, it's driven by the, sort of the low hanging fruit has been picked and now it's going to be much harder to make incremental progress, which is sort of the natural explanation that we've right. hit some sort of natural limits. You go from to horse work. and buggy to trains to airplanes, but what's you know? But supersonic jets don't quite work, so you're stuck at airplanes. Right. Let's say. Right. Um, um, I, the alternate explanation, which I'm more partial to is that it is a cultural uh, kind of a thing and that, uh, that uh, even though there probably are some areas where progress objectively is very hard, there are many areas where uh, we, could, we could still have progress if we really uh, wanted to have it. And so 
it's always this question, is it an external reality that's made it hard, or is it something in the culture that's changed that makes us less ambitious, more risk averse, uh, you know, uh, more scared to, to try to do, do things. And, um, and I do think, uh, I do think the, the regulatory double standard where we have massive regulation in one place and very little in the other suggests us that something like, like that might be going on. Uh, you know the the exam. The, you know there sort of are there are all these examples where uh, one, one striking example is something like the SDI program in the 1980s, where you know I remember at the time the debates were, um, you know, the conservatives argued this was a good thing because it would uh, be a defensive technology. The liberals argued it was going to be a bad thing because it meant the U.S. would have a first strike nuclear capability. But everybody assumed it was going to work, and uh, 20, 25 years later, it sort of is implicitly assume that it's never going to work, right. even though you have things like the Iron Dome technology in Israel, which, which works remarkably well. And it would seem that if you had applied yourself, you could have uh, extended these sorts of technologies to things like uh, um, intercontinental type missiles and things like that. It's harder, but it doesn't feel right. like the sort of thing that would be, that would be impossible. And so I, I do think that uh, um, I, I'm sort of very heavily on the cultural bias uh, I think uh, it's always the part that people are more uncomfortable because it suggests that there was some sort of generational failure versus just external circumstances that were outside of people's control. So I think we're always too biased to go to the natural explanation because it's a it's one that exonerates us from from responsibility for the for the slowdown. And when you say cultural, you mean cultural slash political? You know, it's some combination. Yeah, the sociological. It's, all these things sort of probably are cause and effect. In different you think ways. there has been a slowdown? I mean, that there's apart from I guess Silicon Valley sort of stuff uh, that yes. we are not progressing as we once were, as people expected us to, or as we could be. I suppose. Well, the easy, um, the sort of macroeconomic manifestation of this is um, the relative stagnation in wages in the U.S. since the early 1970s, uh, the sense in which a um, you know, large majority of Americans believe that the next generation will be less well off than the current generation. So there is uh, there's this incredible disconnect between what people believe to be true economically and uh, the story that we're told about uh, accelerating technological, uh, uh, technological progress. Uh, culturally, the sort of uh, failure of an imagination of a different future is uh, seen in um, you know, the example. The simple example I always give is science fiction movies, where if you uh, if you look at all the science fiction films in the last uh, quarter century, they basically show technology that doesn't work, that's dystopian, that kills people. So you can choose between the Terminator or the Matrix, or you know, or um, Avatar, or maybe you know, uh, maybe if we don't get Obamacare, Elysium, mm -hmm. um, and so and that's sort of that's sort of what si and it does not portray a future that's. Uh, sort of radically different and better. I think the Star Trek retread movies are sort of an exception, but that's sort of still a throwback to the 60s. Right. Jetsons are a completely reactionary aesthetic at this point. But it needn't be, you think? You know, I, I, I don't think it needs to be across the board. So I, I do, you know, it's, if you look at, I mean, you know, it's, a lot of these things sound very, um, very out there, but if you look at things like nuclear technology, right. we could be building uh, much safer, much cheaper uh, reactors, um, and and I think it is it is probably a combination of uh, political will and a belief that something like this could work um, that would enable it to work. And if you you don't think it can work, it, it won't happen. Yeah, but it is striking. You're right that if you had asked 50, 60 years ago, people would have assumed, and people did assume. They said energy will be so cheap and plentiful it'll be virtually be like water, right? You can barely it. pay for it even. Yeah, it's uh, because, too cheap to meter. Right. This nuclear power is extremely cheap once you build the plant, presumably, right? I mean, and it's still you don't use up anything, you know, much. I mean, and there's still there's a sense in which it's still, you know, if you sort of think about the energy density of something, uh, probably the more advanced technologies are ones that produce. Uh, more energy with less of a unit of volume or something right. like that and so there's a there's a sense in which something like nuclear power still seems like the energy of the future versus say massively distributed windmills or or um, or solar panels um, are less energy intensive than than say oil or natural gas and, and in that sense seem seem somewhat retrograde yeah and it is striking as you say how much people seem to accept almost the the slowdown in various ways so that 
I guess we're having this success discussion while Israel's fighting its war in Gaza. Iron Dome is working. This is, we're living in a dangerous world. Maybe nuclear proliferation is coming, but there's no demand at all, really, from any quarter in the U.S. Now that I think about it, so well, why don't we build some version of Iron Dome? Are we confident for the next 50 years no one's going to have missiles that could strike the U.S. or no one who does have those missiles might choose to use them in, you know, an analogous to the, yeah, you know, we, Hamas we, striking Israel? Right. And wouldn't it be kind of a prudent thing to spend a few tens of billions of dollars on our version of Iron Dome? But you could multiply examples. I mean, yes. this is just one. Uh, but you're right, nuclear power plants, uh, we're sitting yes. here with the uh, gas prices at, what, almost $4 uh, a gallon. Oil prices, what, about 100 bucks. Uh, uh, and no one's sort of that alarmed about that, even though, what were they, just five, six, seven years ago, they were half that, right? I mean, it, it's presumably not helping our economy to have everyone, to have this new level, apparently, of very high energy prices, yet people kind of have a passivity or uh, fatalism about so many of these issues. We're going to be vulnerable to missiles, we're going to have to pay more for to drive, you know, we can't yes. build things the way we used to, um, can't yeah, go it's, into space. It's, I, I often think that, uh, that if there's, I don't want to be too declinist about this, but if you have sort of this period of uh, generalized stagnation, um, you could sort of accept it, you can deny it, or you can fight it. And the modalities that seem to dominate in our culture are um, acceptance and denial. Right. And probably the Republicans are more on the d denial side, the, maybe a little bit less than before. The uh, Democrats tend to be on the acceptance side. Um, and what's, uh, what, what probably is, is really needed is to, is to fight the stagnation or, or to fight the decline. Because ex acceptance and denial are actually, even though they're opposites in some ways, they're actually very right. similar in that both of them uh, tell you at the core that there's nothing to worry about, there's nothing you can do, it doesn't actually matter. Yeah, that's very interesting. So acceptance would be we live in an era of limits, we can't control things abroad, we can't, it's not worth We it might as well have a clean environment. Space. You might as well, um, you know, but uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't expect too much. You should just sort of um, lower your expectations. Uh, and then denial is something like uh, we're still in an era of growth and it's all happening on its own and it's not actually, it's not a political or cultural question at all. It's just, it's just automatic. That's sort of the Republican view, I guess. I think that view. was, I, especially I that if you just removed one or two bad government policies, I suppose. Yes. So it's always, so it's always very optimistic that you can change it with just one or two policies, and that I think that was, maybe that was the, <coughs> that was probably the Bush era, Bush forty three era Republican view. I think it's it's a little bit less so, but uh, but it's always tricky. How do you how do you get out of denial without going straight to acceptance, which right. seems to be the common modality. So, you know, it's, I, I describe this, this era of technological stagnation, but it's not, you know, it's not meant to be demotivating. It's meant to say, you know, there's a problem and we could be doing, you know, we could be doing a lot better on these things. I mean, it is interesting now that you sort of mentioned it this way. We have this fantastic breakthroughs, obviously, in Silicon Valley from the internet, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But people don't say, well, we've done it in this area. We've gone from landlines to big bulky cell phones to iPhones in, what, 25 years. So why can't we do the analogous thing in space exploration, uh, defending ourselves, energy production, medicine, transportation, medicine? I mean, you could, one can imagine a culture that says that. It might go, the culture might be wrong to say that because maybe these other areas aren't as susceptible with that kind of growth. But we don't even think that way, I'd say. We think this is great and this is nice, but it's sort of unique. And we just chug along the way we're chugging along and hoping that we can get one place to another five minutes faster ten years from now. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a great deal of history, so when, when things haven't worked for a while, people do give up on areas. So, you know, Nixon declares war on cancer in 1970, right. says he will defeat it by the bicentennial in 1976, 44 years later. By definition, we're 44 years closer to the goal, but people, don't, people are less, right. less motivated today than they were in the 1970s. Um, and it would be inconceivable for someone like Obama to get on, on television and say, we're going to declare war on Alzheimer's, even though right. you know, one third of Americans at age 85 are suffering from, from some form of dementia. Uh, and so it would, it would seem like the sort of thing that, uh, that one, one, should, one should try to do something on. But it's, uh, it, just, it, it just does not resonate. And again, I guess it comes back to the question of, does it not resonate because we didn't lick cancer in six years or even in 46 years? And we uh, and we, you know, they they tr 
other claims, hopes have been expressed along these lines with respect to other diseases and other medicines. I mean, so I guess the question is, are people right to be much more sober about the future, or are they now accepting and denying, accepting too much and, and, and or denying too much and not doing what they could be doing in some of these areas? I mean, it's, yeah, it's always, it's always overdetermined. It's some combination right. of, all of all of the above. Uh, but from, from my liking, people are, are too complacent. And I, I do think that uh, it is, it, there is this incredible self-fulfilling aspect. You know, if you think you can do something, thinking you can do something is a necessary precondition for being able to do it. It may not be sufficient, but it surely is necessary. You know, if, uh, it was uh, Wiles, the uh, Princeton mathematician who served, uh, solved Fermat's last theorem, worked on it by himself for, for eight years, uh, solved it after 358 years of people trying, and you know, maybe it was impossible, maybe it was a fool's errand to spend time on that, but if you didn't think that you could do it, you were never going to be the person to do it. And what could turn this around? I mean, you're right, you have this funny combination now, I think, in the general culture. It's a certain kind of complacency, but it's not a happy complacency, really. It's a sort of unhappy, a little sullen, um, you know, sense that we can't do much, so we should accept it, but it's not, we're not satisfied with it, so we lash out occasionally at our political leaders, but... Well, it's, I, I do think, um, I do think if there's a silver lining to the crisis of 2008 and post-2008, it is at least a sense that sort of the automatic tracked things no longer work as well. And so, uh, and so there were, um, for, for a number of decades, there were all these reasonably well-paying jobs people could get that would um, be, uh, would involve taking little risk, would be sort of incremental, um, and you could become a lawyer or a banker or a consultant. And, um, and I think there's, there is some sense that that's, that is, that is uh, no longer working. I, I think Silicon Valley, um, even though it's in some way sort of an exception to this, right. is, is much more charismatic. And so I, I'd be very bullish on Silicon Valley and relatively bull, uh, bearish on New York City, sort of the, a, tale of, uh, a tale of two cities, where New York was the tract uh, thing to do in an f- overly financialized world. And, uh, and I think at this point, um, you have a talented young person in the U.S., uh, Silicon Valley is probably the most uh, charismatic uh, place for that. Now, it, um, it, you know, you, you, the hope <laughs> is that the, the information technology revolution can somehow be expanded uh, more to the world of atoms than it has. But I do think, I do think there's some sense that these set ways of doing things are, are no longer uh, working as well. So there's that, there's that negative sense. It, it, it often doesn't quite translate into positive yet, where people don't know what to do instead. I mean, would you need a political jolt, do you think, or could it be done by private citizens in terms of founding businesses that do what the equivalent of, you know, Facebook or PayPal in medicine and uh, space exploration and other such things? I mean... It, it varies in all these different areas. I mean, certainly there was, there was some deregulation of the space industry under Bush 43, and this probably enabled a private company like, like SpaceX to gain right. traction. Uh, it's, it's hard to see how medicine can work without a less onerous FDA. So I do think there are parts where you're um, incredibly embedded in this risk-averse political system. Uh, there are probably some other technologies like, say, Uber or Airbnb, the, the car service and the um, short-term rental um, company, where um, in a way you can, things can grow very quickly and the technology can sort of outpace the politics. And so, right. you know, you're, you're often in the sort of gray legal zone, but then um, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, um, people will not want to shut it down because there are tens of thousands of people who are making a living on this. So, so I think if you can get something to grow quickly enough, um, you may not need to. You can, the politics may sort of get dragged along, um, but it's uh, it's it's things where you need political cooperation ex ante that are that are quite hard to change. And do you think American? Can, I guess the question is. It could either American liberalism or American conservatism, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, really embrace what I think you would like to see, which is a real sense of uh, recommitment to progress and to big progress, right? I mean, you, 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 I've heard you talk before about, in this respect, people, everyone is now accepting of, or sometimes unhappy about, but not really willing to do much about globalization. But globalization really isn't the same as 
real technological breakthroughs and technological progress. Well, they're extremely, globalization is about some sort of convergence theory of history in which uh, the <coughs> developing and developed nations converge. Um, and, uh, and sort of a lot of the rhetoric around globalization is implicitly anti-technological. And so when we split the world into developed and developing nations, this is a pro-globalization dichotomy. But it's also an anti-technology dichotomy because we're implicitly saying that the developed world is that part of the world where nothing new is going to happen, where nothing is going to change, where things are basically stuck. And, uh, and so I think the, the question that I, I would like to see us ask more is how can we develop the developed world yeah, or, or so, something, something like that. Um, it's, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not involved in, you know, any sort of political, uh, I don't, haven't run for public office or don't intend to run for public office, but I, and I, 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 I so I don't know exactly how you convey this, this rhetorically. Um, I do worry that, uh, that um, a sort of pro-big progress uh, political message, um, you know, resonates very strangely. So when Gingrich right. says we should go back to the moon, it's like, well, you're really lost in space or something, something like that. And uh, and so I don't know if you pushed for building hundreds of new nuclear power plants, whether that would, how well that would that sort of thing would would go over. But I, I do think, um, I do think that, um, you know, I do think that the sort of pessimism that is endemic to places like Japan or Western Europe um, is somewhat un-American. And so there is, there is, a, there is, <coughs> there is, and so it is really critical. There still is always an opening to tell a more optimistic story and that we could be doing a lot better than we are. But it does seem a lot of the talk about optimism these days is talk about optimism rather than actually acting in an optimistic way, right? Right. So Republicans say our best days are not behind us, you know, but it's... You know, it always like, has a feeling of uh, protesting too much right, or something exactly. like that. Um, and so I, I do, I, I don't know, I, I do think, I do think that uh, a lot of these things will happen in, in, in very specific contexts. I think, I think if we had less regulation, you know, a lot, a lot of these things could happen. Um, it's possible, it's possible there will be some global, you know, maybe the FDA will have less of a um, you know, less of a throttle on global innovation in biotechnology, and so there are sort of ways one can imagine that things things will change in the uh, in the decades ahead. I, I do think, but I do th I do think the the um, the most uh, there is sort of a sense in which the tracked narratives feel feel exhausted, and that's that's why I think there is there is an opening today in a way in which there was not, say, in. 2007 or 2006. I'm mean, just thinking, I guess the last person to really run for office with a big vision of change was Reagan. I mean, mm -hmm. it was partly a reaction against Carter, obviously, mm -hmm. and a reaction against the failures of his own party under Nixon and Ford. <coughs> Excuse me. But there was also a sense of, I mean, Reagan believed this much more than his advisors or than most conservatives, that you could actually win the Cold War with the right, right combination of defense buildup and moral challenge to the Soviet Union. And he believed, again, much more than many of his advisors, that with the right mix of tax cuts and deregulation, you could really get the economy going again. And in both of these, those he was, at least over the short, medium term, uh, very much vindicated. Yes. And if you think about it, I guess no one really has the kind of proposals, the tweaks, whether it's reform conservatism on the right or Clinton's kind of form of New Democrat uh, reforms or President Obama, even Obamacare, such a big, you know, allegedly such a big program and one that someone like me doesn't like at all because of how big it is and how much it impedes our liberties and stuff. Still, at the end of the day, is it really transforming healthcare in the United States? No, it's just making it more bureaucratic and so forth. So the, the lack of ambition of major politicians yeah. is pretty, and political parties is pretty striking. The rhetorical version of this that I always think is, is striking is, um, you know, when were the last political speeches you can remember where people uh, in very concrete terms portrayed a future that looks very different from the present? So you can, uh, you can imagine Martin Luther King, you know, I have a dream of a nation yeah, no longer divided. And so it's radically different from the present, a much better, very different looking future. The last, uh, the last speech like this that I, uh, that I can really identify would be uh, Reagan at uh, Berlin, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that yeah. wall where it's you know, very concrete terms, a future that looks uh, radically different and, and much better than the present. Um, and somehow that, that works uh, much less well. 
you know, the, uh, during the Obama campaign in 2008, um, there was a subtle change in the way the, uh, the slogan worked, where you started with the slogan, Hope and Change, and in the course of the campaign, that slogan changed to the change we need. And so, in other words, it changed from maximal change to the absolute minimum amount of change that's absolutely necessary, which is quite a striking right. reversal, because it, it turned out the change poll tested very badly. People were scared of change. They thought that change meant change for the worse, not for the better. And I think that is, that is the sort of political malaise that, uh, that you're up against, whether you're a Democratic or Republican politician. Yeah, maybe in retrospect, Obama, for all the talk about hope and change and how new it all was and exciting, was kind of an echo or a shadow, I don't know, the way, you know, of, of real hopes for change. You know, you think about what really was he going to change in America uh, compared well, to... What's in incredibly abstract. Right. And so, it's, uh, and, so, and so the abstractions enable people to project onto it whatever, whatever they want to, but it, it suggests that there's not that much, not going to be sort of any specific leadership in, in one direction or another. And I, I think it's, but I think, again, I think this is not a problem limited to Obama or Clinton or the Democrats. It's, I think it's really, no. these, For, these abstractions are sort of very much across the board. I mean, Mitt Romney was going to get entrepreneurship going again in America or something like that, but that's, you know, <laughs> again, yeah. there wasn't much I'm skeptical even of the word entrepreneur, so yes. Right, right. Um, I guess, again, when it comes back to the question of is this a recognition of a reality we're now living in? There's no cold water wind. There's no, uh, it's not so easy to just deregulate oil and cut taxes mm -hmm. and have 6% economic growth for uh, six, seven years uh, as under Reagan. Or is it a failure of imagination, a failure of will somehow, as you say, a kind of cultural change somehow? And could it come back? I guess the other question is, do you need these external events to spur a nation or a culture on to sort of embracing these big changes. The space program came yes. out of, uh, to some degree, the Cold War. Yes. Yes. So I, you know, I, I don't, I don't quite, um, I don't quite know what it would change to, what it would require to, to change the, the sort of uh, malaise. But I, I do think, I do think that a world in which little changes and little, there's little progress represents a, uh, a radical departure from the past. And, yeah. uh, and uh, it, it is something we should fight really hard in, in all, all, all ways that uh, we, we possibly can. You know, I, I sort of wonder <coughs> whether, you know, on some level the U.S. constitutional system can even work without some sort of growth. Because I think that the way, the way things fundamentally work is you have people around the table in the Congress, the White House, and you pass bills that, um, that give some more a little bit for you, a little bit for me, a little bit for everybody. If you're a difficult person who doesn't get along with people, there's there's nothing for you. And that sort of a that sort of a political mechanism works quite well so long as uh, the pie is growing. If the pie is not growing, uh, there's much less need to cooperate to craft uh, to craft new legislation. And it is actually not clear to me, um, you know, how well, you know, how well our our constitutional system um, even works. You know the. We've, we've had in the Western world 200 years of, of growth, uh, 250 years of growth since the late 18th century. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the 1930s, which is probably the one decade where there was a real shock to growth, um, it put enormous strain on all the sort of constitutional, democratic, republican types of, uh, types of systems. And I, I do think that's, a, that's an enormous challenge um, in, in our time. So, so I, th I think we should not be complacent about this at all. Peter, you've been involved in American higher education uh, for a long time uh, and uh, critical of it, actually, especially in recent years. So is it the best in the world? What's, what's wrong? Well, it, uh, I, I think sort of many of these, uh, many of these uh, challenges that we've discussed uh, also apply in the higher education context where, um, you know, it's, it's probably, uh, the, you know, if you define technology as doing more with uh, less, um, education is perhaps the most anti-technological uh, aspect of our society today where uh, you're getting the same at a higher and higher price. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, the real costs of higher education since 1980 have gone up about 400 percent. It's after inflation. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's not clear the quality's gone up at all. It's, uh, the, and so I, I think... Uh, it's hard to even imagine 
how that is. I mean, you know, it's, not, it's the classrooms are the same, the teachers are the same, the facilities are a little bit better. Four hundred percent. It really is a, a bizarre. What you think well, about it's it? it's on some level. Uh, on some level, the universities have found that they can just charge more every year, and uh, and I think uh, and so I think the you know the question is maybe why has there not been more resistance to these right. these price hikes, and I think it again in part goes to this failure of an imagination of an alternate future, and so. Uh, talented people should all go to the same universities, learn the same things, uh, uh, pursue the same uh, types of careers, and uh, and so I think we have a, we have a you know if we had an internet bubble or a housing bubble, we certainly have an education uh, bubble today, and it has uh, it is um, you know bubbles are characterized by um, things costing more than they're worth, they're characterized by sort of intense psychosocial dynamics, so it's. Um, it's very hard for people to suggest that you should not go to a, the best college you can get into right. because people don't know what else to do. So it's again this sort of failure of imagination of an alternate future. Um, and it's also, bubbles are also characterized by abstractions away from reality. And, uh, and so I think the word education itself um, is this incredible abstract filler. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's worth you know, drilling down a lot more on what is going on, and that's the sort of thing you're generally not allowed to do. So, what is it specifically that you're learning? Right. So, uh, you know, engineering is it some rigorous humanities course, or is it just education in the abstract? Um, and uh, you know, I've often suggested you could you could think of uh, you can think of this in economic terms. You can think of is education an investment decision, where it's basically uh, something you invest to get a better paying job. Is it a consumption decision where it's sort of a four-year party, um, and uh, maybe uh, maybe it's sort of a combination of a bad investment and bad consumption decision where basically uh, people think they are investing by consuming, which was characteristic of the housing bubble where you bought an especially large house with a swimming pool and you patted yourself on the back for being an incredibly frugal investor, right. and uh, and so there's sort of an aspect of that. But I've come to think that uh, even more than investment or consumption. Um, it's perhaps better to think of um, education as uh, understood as an insurance policy, where it's uh, it's probably not worth as much as people are paying for it, but they're scared of falling through the cracks in our society, and so as the cracks get bigger, we pay more and more for uh, for insurance against it. That's the way it's advertised, and then I think the reality is that it's the exact opposite of an insurance policy. It is actually sort of this this crazy zero sum tournament in which um, in which what really matters is getting into the best schools, and then um, a diploma from a third-tier university um, is really a dunce hat in disguise. And so, um, and so uh, there is. So I think at, at its core, it's perhaps a, a, um, a zero-sum tournament um, masquerading as as, uh, as general insurance, and that's that's incredibly dissonant. And can it be changed? I mean, as long as I've been, <clears throat> I came here to work in the education department. We thought higher ed was ripe for change, and doesn't look very different now than it did 25, 30 years ago. Um, you know, the tone, historically, I think the tone has been set by the, the top universities. They have uh, these enormously uh, rich endowments, and uh, they are incredibly resistant to, uh, to influence from the outside. And, uh, and so I do, think, I do think it's the kind of thing that's very hard to reform uh, from, uh, from without. It is, um, it is nevertheless, I think, Heading towards a crisis of sorts, where uh, it simply no longer works for um, the vast majority of uh, middle-class students who are amassing enormous amounts of debt uh, going to college, and so there is going to be uh, enormous pressure. It's 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 hard to say exactly what the timing on this is, but I think some of the online alternatives, um, you know, are going to get more traction as these uh, as these financial pressures start to mount. Um, you know, one of my uh, one of my friends has characterized uh, um, the university system as uh, as the atheist church, which is sort of a successor to the Catholic Church. It's sort of universal, um, and uh, and that the university system in 2014, it's like the Catholic Church circa 1514. Um, there's less diversity, so you have the Dominicans and the Franciscans and all these right. different orders, whereas the diversity between, say, the Harvard and Stanford political science department is considerably less. Um, but it is sort of uh, you have this priestly class of professors that doesn't that uh, doesn't do very much work. Uh, people are 
buying indulgences in the form of uh, amassing enormous debt for the sort of uh, secular salvation that a, a diploma uh, represents. And, um, and what I think is very similar to, uh, to uh, the 16th century is that the Reformation will come largely from outside. It will, uh, um, and then, you know, at some point, maybe there will be some, you know, internal need to adapt. Right. But I think the first move will, will have to come from outside because uh, you have sort of systems that are so far decoupled from, from what, what, what actually makes sense. Uh, and the people are so, um, they're so uh, bought into a system that's, that right. does, just does not work that, uh, that I, th I think you will see enormous resistance from the faculty. And the, I think it seems to me it's a combination of sort of bureaucratic, bureaucratic sloth, I guess, and um, resistance to change on the one hand and then the political correctness on the other. And I guess they go together more than perhaps people, some people focus on political correctness, mm -hmm. the more ideological critics of higher education, the financial critics, you know, focus on the self-perpetuating uh, tenure system and, and uh, endless growth apparently of bureaucracy and cost. But I, I suspect there's some relationship of those two. Well, there's um, <coughs> well, there's a there is a incredible conformity, um, and there's a um, and there is and sort of the questions of how are you training people to uh, to think in uh, in different uh, ways um, have have really uh, gotten lost sight of. I I think um, I think it is striking how little of a focus there is on teaching yeah. in in general and. Uh, and you know there is sort of the subtle point where something goes from a not great system into an all-out racket. Where uh, does it? How much sense does it make for professors to really invest in their graduate students and PhD programs when there's a sense that none of these people will get jobs anymore anyway? Right. And so th I, I think you are sort of in this in this zone of where uh, it has in many ways become this uh, this incredible racket and it's, 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 it, it is hard to really know what people inside it think. And I think just objectively people say it's the greatest, it's the best system ever, and, but just as an obvious matter, people are not as well educated today as they were, the elites at least, 70 or 80 years ago. People know fewer languages, they memorize less poetry, they're less familiar with history and just literature. I mean just in very obvious ways someone graduating, uh, certainly from European universities, but maybe from American universities as well just uh, seems to me ha had a better education, leaving entirely aside politics here, yes. uh, well, than today, which is just sort of amazing. Th you think someone should be able, and, uh, and that strikes me as also ripe for challenge. If someone set themselves up and said, we're going to really educate, this would be K through 12 too, obviously. We're going to provide a real education. Mm -hmm. There's no reason young people in 2014 mm -hmm. should be less well educated than a young person was in 1914, but it's evidently the case in many ways, you know? Yes, well, the. Uh there is sort of an egalitarian assumption embl embedded in education where, uh, where it's assumed um, that everyone is more or less the same. Exactly. And therefore, um, if you look at how well do people do who graduate from Harvard versus people who just have a high school diploma, and let's say they make twice as much money per year if they graduate from Harvard as with a high school diploma, um, it's assumed that this is prima facie evidence of how um, great the Harvard education is. When I think the reality is much more that it's a super selective uh, selection effect, and so there's selection, there's signaling, um, relatively little uh, sort of value-added learning. But uh, because we have this egalitarian mindset, it's, it's sort of hard to make the argument that it is just um, this, uh, this selection rather than a value-added learning. Um, you know, the obvious, uh, the obvious way to illustrate this would be if you said that the top universities in the U.S. were doing as good a job as they claim the most natural thing for them to do would be to increase enrollment. So if you say you have 1,600 people a year going to Harvard and we're, do, we're offering them a fantastic education that's making them much better than they otherwise would have been, you know, I mean, could, you, could you sort of have some structured growth plan where you increase that number to maybe 3,000 over 20 years? Uh, certainly the population of the country is a lot larger. Right. It's, uh, it's attracting people from all over the world. And so, um, so if you're offering such a great education, what sort of a product is it that um, where you wouldn't increase the number of people who use it? I mean, I think the only the only product I can think of where you would limit access as much would be a nightclub, <laughs> which is which is a which is sort of uh, again a zero sum product right. that's based on exclusion. 
And I think that if you went to any of these top universities and you proposed doubling the enrollment, um, you would get a uniform opposition from the alumni, from the current students, from the faculty, because it would they would rightly right. perceive that it would make it less prestigious, even though that, that sort of goes very much against this egalitarian ethos that everyone's the same. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good contrarian point of view that you're taking there on, on higher education. But I, think, I think the rhetoric around education is always that it's a positive sum game, because right. there's this naive intuition that, you know, knowledge, uh, if I know something and I teach it to you, we both will know it, and so there's something about knowledge that's fundamentally this incredibly positive sum aspect. And I think it masks the, uh, the very zero-sum aspect of, uh, of education. I mean, I went to, I went to uh, law school, and if you look at the law schools, it's, you know, there's this brutal ranking on the U.S. News and World Report scale okay. where uh, you know, the top three, I think, are still very good. So if you go to Harvard, Stanford, or Yale, that's really good. Then I think there's sort of four after that that are pretty good. And then there's sort of the numbers 8 to 14, where maybe if you're in the top half of the class. And then probably numbers 15 to 200. Um, it's, uh, it's very unclear whether um, it's a positive value for anybody who goes, or for bottom 90% of those classes. Yeah, it's kind of amazing how fast the law school situation seems to have changed in five or 10 years, which does make one wonder whether the apparent stability of higher ed in general, or I'd say education in general, or I'd say even more generally, you know, whole chunks of the culture and of, and of our institutions that seem so impervious to change. Government would be another one. You do wonder whether, you know, they can chug along for longer than one thinks, but then when they really, when things really hit, when things begin to change, it could all change faster than one thinks. So I think, I think when I've, when I've looked at this, I think in the 1980s and 1990s, one saw uh, rapidly escalating costs in education, but also increasing inequality in our society. And so there, it was at least correlated. It was always worth going to the top college because right. you'd, you'd make more money and it would sort of seemingly make up for it. Um, Post-2000, even though there still is a vast gulf between high school graduates and college graduates, it stopped widening. The costs have kept going up. And so, uh, so the relative value of a college education has actually been going down since about 2000. If you say we're to measure the value of a college education by how many years does it take you to pay off your debt, the number of years was actually going down in the 80s and 90s because the premium was going up even faster than the costs were escalating. Post 2000, it's taking longer and longer to pay off the debt. So the, the actually the relative premium has been in decline for for 14 years now, and I think again 2008 was a was a bit of a watershed moment where um, where all of a sudden uh, there were sort of a lot fewer of these tracked positions available. Uh, you know when when uh, kids graduate from college and move back in with their parents, that was not part of the deal the parents had implicitly signed. It sounds like it's a a sector of American life ripe for uh, new founders to come along and do things as you did in in in, in tech and in Silicon Valley. But it's so I guess, is it possible? I mean, could well, one it's, it's it's certainly it's 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 incredibly distorted. Um, you know, it's uh, one of the things that's uh, one of the things that uh, makes the education bubble different from say the housing or the or the tech bubble of, of the last decades is that it is actually very hard to measure what the quality of of education is. And so when people say things like, you'll figure it out in 20 years, there are things you will learn that are intangible, that will help you 20 years in the future, you know, somewhat cynical cut on that might be that, uh, well, this is the sort of thing you say if you're running a scam, where you want to have a really long right. shelf life to it so people won't notice that they've been defrauded for a long time. But uh, there is something about the um, immeasurability of education that's made the uh, education bubble um, quite durable. But on the other hand, that's, it probably also means that it's gotten bigger and bigger in a way that's um, that's extremely distorted. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I think we are we are at a point where uh, where it's going to start changing. And you know, our our backgrounds are in these elite universities. You went to Harvard. I went to went to Stanford. I think those are the ones that will be the last to change. And so we may be we may be underestimating how much change is going to be happening in the next five ten years in this you know very broad swath of of colleges where um, the cost-benefit calculation is is not working in any sense of the word anymore. Yeah, no, I very much agree with that. But I do wonder also even for elite students, if you think of the product as education as opposed to going to college, whether one won't over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years 
uh, people will get educated in very different ways. Much less of it will focus on what actually happens in these accredited institutions of higher education or maybe uh, even K-12, or maybe the institutions will have to change, therefore, a lot in terms of... Well, it's, it, it is a question whether the... Uh, you know, there's a question how good are the elite institutions even for the people who go there. Right. Uh, so one, one of my friends uh, who uh, started at Yale in 2001, the, the dean welcomed him by welcome to the class by saying, congratulations, you know, you're set for life. You got into Yale. And this is um, 17 years old. This, Terrible, seems, yeah. this seems slightly off. It, like maybe it's true as long as you absolutely never believe it to be true. But if, right. you, if you actually were to believe that, it's, uh, it's, it's probably quite toxic. And so I, I think that... Uh, and insofar as it tracks people into probably safe trajectories, which may not turn out so great, as you said, you know, and, you know, you, you're not so sure if, if it's even true at that level anymore, you know. Yeah, I, I suspect that, um, uh, you know, there's the, the K through 12 tracking to the elite universities uh, sets people up in ways where when things don't quite work out automatically for them afterwards, uh, they're, they're not that resilient, they're not that able to recover. Um, there is an amazing degree to which people's ambitions get beaten out of them in these yes, that's in these really uh, true. in these top universities. If I if I look at what uh, people thought my my senior year in high school, sort of like were very ambitious. They had all these ideas what they were going to do, and if you looked at the same people at uh, sort of college plus five years, sort of nine years later, let's say, uh, it was amazing how much things have been ratcheted down. And so I I do think there's something problematic where all the talented people go to these schools they're sort of evaluated on the same terms and at the end uh, at the end a lot of ambitions are are beaten out of them you know, probably the, the the one that I think is um, even worse for people than Harvard in this respect uh, might be a uh, might be Caltech where you have you know these brilliant math physics people and it, after four years where you're in the middle of your class you're convinced that the most you can do with your life is become a line engineer at Lockheed and maybe you can go into mid-level management uh, 20 years later. And so th that is, that sort of is characteristic of, uh, of, uh, of what I think has happened. And what, what, what I think we need to somehow find a way back to is, is this idea that, um, that there's not just a single track, that there are very different things uh, you can do. You know, the question, you know, what truth do you know that nobody agrees with you on? The, the, the sort of career version of this is um, what what are you really good at <coughs> that other people aren't that good at or right. or something like that and that's uh, and that somehow gets discouraged by this by this incredible homogenization and big ambitions get discouraged I think that you think everyone the, you then everyone and it's true of all of us I suppose we <coughs> we decide we can make it in a certain line and, and do things a little you know move ahead step by step with the kind of um, yeah, there's always there's so always the ambition to be a founder. That if, to come back to what we were talking about earlier, that seems to be knocked out. The whole, both the institutions and the mindset that permeates the institutions, is almost a denial that that ambition is reasonable or even possible. Well, there's a sense that um, there are all these people who are ahead of you. So there's always this sense there's so many people who are uh, who are much better than you or just as good as you. So who are you to think that you can do right. anything? Um, anything different and um, and obviously when everybody starts to think that nobody does anything and in fact it becomes self-fulfilling once again and no one no one does anything different yeah well you're a good example of doing something different so I I thank you for that actually because I think it's important and I think the question really is though it's amazing how many people think you and Mark Zuckerberg and everyone else have done these different things but it's only doable in that one area of the country Silicon Valley and in that one area of business and of uh, enterprise, which is sort of, you know, information technology. It's sort of hard to see why that would be the case, of course, but, but politics, culture as a whole, other parts of business, it is striking how the, the weird combination of, maybe it's not weird, of passivity and a certain kind of complacency and passivity and sullenness all at once. It's not entirely a, a healthy picture, I think. Yeah, um, well, I think, I think that, uh, I think people um, I should put this. Uh, people, it, it is it is always you know coming back to one of the points you made earlier. It, it is always very important to think through where is there a freedom of action that's possible, and what spheres um, you know is there is there sort of a lot less you know a lot less freedom of action and uh, and 
probably the academic setting, um, you know, the thing it gears the most talented students towards is academia itself. Right. And, uh, and that is probably a place where the sphere of action has gone down, you know, as much as anywhere in the last yeah. uh, 40 or 50 years. You know, this sort of the, this idea that you know all the all road scholars had a great future in their past, or mm -hmm. and it's um, and it's 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 because they're they're encouraged to then do these these super conventional things where it turns out a lot of other people are doing basically the same things, and you end up again with this question: Why does it matter for you to do it if twenty other people are doing it already? And uh, I, I I do think it's again to end on a somewhat more optimistic note: It's it is it is not the case that. Everything is so exhausted, and that there are right. so that you know the set. This is again sort of this cultural, natural question: is, is the set of possibilities really this narrow, where it's um, there only are these tracked things with a few positions at the end of these these tracks that are any good, or are there are there really a lot of um, you know unexplored paths and and you know hidden paths that are much more promising that that people should explore? And I think the the, the political correctness tells us that you know everything that's conventionally known is true. There's nothing um, nothing outside that that works, and and so that's how I think it probably intersects with this tracking in a very deep way. Well, I hope people watching are encouraged to try non-conventional things and have gotten some guidance from you. I think they really have on on how to even how to think about that and how to go about uh, exploring uh, hidden paths or new paths and uh, ahead in many different ways. So I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining me today, and thank you for joining us on Conversations. Thank you.